Okay, good afternoon, folks. Uh, uh, clearly, we have a popular speaker today, and hopefully on a popular topic as well, the uh, machine learning, physical sciences, machine learning nexus. Nexus to bring together, clearly is doing that. And today, we have a seminar by our esteemed Professor Burke, um, <clears throat> who is well known, I think, to many of you, and will become well known from this talk, I think, because he gives quite engaging talks. Uh, today is International Women in Science Day. So I'm asking Professor Burke to speak in falsetto and raise it to give some uh, to, uh, accord to that, okay? If we do the calculations, we know that that's on average gonna work. Okay, so Professor Burke will speak to us and engage us in machine learning across topics in physical sciences and I thank very much our ICS colleagues who have trod this path many ways and will contribute as well for us. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Roger. Uh, and <clears throat> I was going to show these slides at the end, but uh, I'll show them now. Uh, these slides were made by Bupali Kalita, uh, who I'll talk about. Uh, so this is the idea behind the, the, the Nexus, if you weren't here for some of the previous events, where we're just trying to get everybody together who's involved in, in sort of machine learning and data science in general within physical sciences, uh, with lots of help from our computer science friends, both at the sort of professor type level and also at the, uh, at the graduate student and postdoc level. And we have another event Next Friday at four o'clock, there's another social hour here. Uh, they're on every other week. Uh, and these are the data science fellows that were appointed a month or two ago uh, in the physical sciences, one from each department. And uh, Jacob Bupali is my student, Zhang Long and Tian Yao Soup. Uh, so one from each thing, and you'll see their faces uh, around the place. Uh, okay. And I just wanted to mention, I have uh, a UC Presidential Fellow working with me on totally different things, but does a lot of uh, machine learning stuff uh, with undergraduates, uh, a lot of them provided uh, by Domingos Bengali, who's here, uh, Bengali, and doing NMR, uh, analyzing NMR spectra is one of the big things that they're doing. And what I'm gonna talk about is nothing to do with any of that, right? Because I'm a theorist, and so I'm going to be, so I'll try to talk broadly about machine learning and physical sciences, but also uh, I'll be focusing on my own little sort of journey with it. Uh, okay, so this is the start of the talk, right? So uh, this was my title, Machine Learning in Electronic Structure Theory, A Brave New World. I'm going to first introduce sort of electronic structure theory and what it is because there's a lot of people from many different fields. Uh, and I'll do that rather briefly, and then I'll talk about the impact that machine learning has been having over the last 10 or 15 years in this area, and then I'll focus a lot on, on stuff I've been involved with, uh, and then maybe I'll have time toward the end. Well, I've tell, told you about the nexus, but some observations from my experience uh, working in this sort of intermediate area. Okay, so electronic structure theory, all these different uh, materials, all the ma everyday materials that we see are really just nuclei held together by a bunch of electrons. And so you have this problem that you wanna solve over and over again, which is the ground state energy, the lowest energy state of these electrons. Uh, they sit in their lowest energy state at room temperature and they're the glue that hold uh, atoms together in molecules or atoms together in materials. And uh, so if you can find their lowest energy, you can predict a huge number of properties of these materials, such as their geometry, their bond energies, reaction rates, all sorts of things come from knowing the ground state energy. And, uh, but to, to do that on a computer, uh, you need to solve the Schrodinger equation, at least you usually do, and it's this 3n dimensional Schrodinger equation where n is the number of electrons. So as the system gets bigger and bigger, this gets uh, harder and harder to solve, 
and sort of solving it very accurately, which we know how to do with traditional quantum chemical methods, uh, scales rather badly as n to the seventh. Uh, so as this, if you double the size of the system, the cost goes up by more than a factor of 100. So no matter what size molecule you, no matter how big your computer is, if somebody gives you a molecule and you figure out its properties, as soon as you do that, they will almost immediately give you the molecule that's twice as big and want to know the properties of that, and you won't be able to afford to do it. Uh, so you can do this for, let's say, of the order of 20 atoms or so, rather routinely, but not much more than that. Okay. And a, pro a part of the problem here is chemical accuracy is about one part in 10 to the seven. So this is a technical term, one kilocal per mole uh, in chemical uh, language. And so it's about one in 10 million if you have something like 500 atoms. Uh, so this is very, very demanding to get this kind of accuracy from such a huge calculation. Okay. Now the reason I got involved in it is because of this thing called density functional theory. Uh, which was developed about 50 years or so ago, the modern version of it, uh, by this guy here, Walter Cohn, who passed away uh, three or four years ago, and he was my PhD advisor. And in the 60s, they proved these theorems that, in fact, you could solve this problem uh, just thinking about it in terms of the single particle electron density, the probability of finding electrons in a given region of space in your system instead of thinking about solving the whole Schrodinger equation. And in particular, they wrote down what are now called the Cohn-Sham equations, uh, he and Lu Sham, uh, which are a fictitious set of equations for non-interacting electrons. And I always show this picture. So this is the density of the helium uh, atom, so the simplest system you could think of with two electrons that repel each other and th this black line here is the attraction of the nuclei of those two electrons. And you should solve the Schrodinger equation with that attraction. But this red line here is the, called the Cohn-Sham potential. And if I put two fake non-interacting electrons in this potential, a doubly occupy the 1s orbital, I get exactly this density. And if I know this very small piece of the energy called the exchange correlation energy as a functional of the density, uh, I, and can differentiate it, I get a self-consistent set of equations, and if this formula for this exchange correlation energy is exact, they'll give me the exact density and the exact ground state energy of this two electron system. So this is sort of theoretical sleight of hand, but what it does is it sets up the problem so that I only have to solve for electrons that don't repel each other. So in this huge partial differential equation, suddenly I've turned off the interaction between the particles, and I just have to occupy the lowest n levels of a potential, and I get, uh, I get out my ground state energy and density. Nothing else in this picture, but that's what people actually want from these kinds of calculations. Uh, and then we, but of course, the, there's no, totally free lunch, you have to write down approximate functionals, which, uh, uh, and uh, how accurate the approximation is determines how accurate your answers will be when you go to solve electronic structure problems. And these are the standard ones in use today, uh, and they use the density and its gradient and a, a little bit of Hartree-Fock. So they are what we call local approximations or semi-local approximations meaning that you just get the information about the energy at a point in space from looking at the density and its gradient. So these are not exact, they're approximate, uh, and they turn out to be usefully uh, accurate, but not as accurate as we'd like them to be. Uh, but about 80 or 90% of, of all calculations today use those, uh, those kinds of formulas. So I, I, I randomly picked a few applications uh, to illustrate this, uh, so this is from our chemistry department, and I see at least one of the authors here, Bill Evans. Uh, now, so, so these, the, I'm reliably informed that these little points here, these are atoms, guys, right? Uh, and this one is thorium, right, which is uh, uh, an exciting atom in many, many ways. And so these are various new chemical complexes that in, found in Bill Evans's lab, and then these calculations of what their structures are 
are guided by knowing the energy differences between all the different possibilities. Uh, okay, uh, that's about as far as I read on that one, Bill, sorry. Uh, uh, this is from Wilson Ho's lab in collaboration with uh, uh, Wu Chen Wu, uh, and Greg Sapp is the first author. I remember him being in one of my classes a few years ago, and they're doing magnetic STM, and they're uh, this is in science last year, and you see they calculate all these levels, and it's 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 very this is a very demanding calculation, and they're getting good agree. They were able to understand the S, uh, the inelastic spectrum using Ruchen's uh, codes for the DFT calculations. Uh, this is from Soft Materials, uh, and this is a collab Our material science department doesn't really do electronic structure. Uh, this is Alan Gordetsky, uh, who's in that department, but a friend of mine, uh, Sahar Sharif Sada, she, she was an assistant professor at Boston University, but she actually grew up around here, so uh, she would come to visit her family, and then she would come and work with me uh, while she was visiting, and then I got these guys together, and now they're doing incredibly difficult calculations of soft materials. Uh, that are, are very important. Uh, this is uh, from a younger friend of mine, Lin Lin, a mathematician who uh, I think just got tenure at Berkeley. Uh, and th these are uh, mathematicians, applied mathematicians, studying the algorithms behind uh, that are go into these codes. And Lin Lin is very, very good and he has come up with a number of very significant improvements. Uh, these codes are sort of legacy codes. They've been around for 40 years using certain algorithms, and Lin Lin is, is very good at finding uh, better ones that run faster. And the faster your, your calculation goes, the larger the system that you can calculate. Uh, so routinely people can do, say, 500 atoms uh, these days. This is one of my favorites the guilt head Seabream, and the reason uh, he or she comes up uh, on the slide is um, the study I found, it's not so long ago, uh, this uh, last year, Frontiers in, in Physiology, which apparently is quite a respectable journal. Uh, so so this, this fish is not endangered, uh, but what it is is that they have farms of these fish and they use them to test uh, various climate effects, and, and so people worry about the oceans acidifying. And, and you know, the oceans have not acidified an, a whole lot, but it turns out just a tiny little bit of acidification messes with the, their sense of smell. And what they're doing is DFT calculations of these uh, olfactory molecules, and the idea is that predators, uh, they use their sense of smell to register when there are predators nearby. And so when the oceans acidify just a tiny bit, their sense of smell gets messed up and uh, they get eaten, right? And so this is sort of the, sort of an effect of climate change. And of course, so recently in the last, say, two or three years, people are really beginning to do these DFT calculations uh, not so much on fish, but on little aerosol particles looking at reaction rates to put into these very large uh, climate change models. And, and calculating reaction rates, you need to be able to calculate them to an extreme degree of accuracy, uh, energetic differences to a very, very high accuracy if you want to get sensible reaction rates. And most of our DFT calculations are not good enough for what people need them to do for uh, climate modeling. Uh, but this is a picture I often show how useful this stuff is. This is the number of kilo papers uh, per year. Being, so it's a good thing that people don't print out these papers, right? Because that would be an environmental problem all by itself. Uh, and this is now, I think, at least exceeded 45,000 a year uh, at this point. We haven't done a, a check lately. Uh, so yes, yeah, so in Virtually all branches of science, people are now using these, these, these tools. Uh, uh, and so, yes, so one point I want to make before I go on is in this area, uh, you can do maybe 500 atoms quite comfortably on a single machine in a day, but 
the underlying theorems tell us that there is also a density functional which solves these cone sham equations uh, directly without having to find these orbitals and things like that. So it's called orbital free DFT. And if we could only find this accurately enough, you, could, you would bypass solving them and maybe you could do a million atoms. So, so there's a whole branch of science where people are doing molecular dynamics with force fields, as we'll see. Uh, but the trouble with a lot of the force fields is they don't account for breaking and making chemical bonds. And that's why they do electronic structure. But with only 500 atoms, you can only do a pretty small uh, sample. Whereas if you could do a million, there are many, many more problems you could tackle. Okay. So that's, that's density functional theory in 15 minutes. Any questions on that part from the floor? Uh, we're good down there. Uh, okay, so watch out because sometimes there's a quiz. Uh, so you might want to ask the questions now. Is there in the ground state? Hmm? There in the ground state, state yes. Uh, okay, so now I'll get on to this, uh, the machine learning stuff, right? Uh, so, uh, a couple of, so a lot of meetings that I go to these days, uh, about half of them I would say are machine learning and physics. Uh, physicists have embraced this quite uh, a lot, and people are really looking at ways to uh, sort of really accelerate learning new physics using machine learning. Uh, and this was a meeting we had in, in uh, at the Chinese Academy of Science a uh, uh, couple of years ago, and unfortunately, we just uh, postponed the meeting, the, the second meeting, which was going to be this year, because invitations were beginning to slow down, uh, acceptances of invitations were slowing down pretty quickly. Now, hopefully, we'll have it again uh, the following year. So a lot of things are machine learning and physics, and then a lot of other things are sort of machine learning and electronic structure, because a lot of the applications are in chemistry and materials. So this is an article, uh, well, I, get, I guest edited a special topic of the Journal of Chemical Physics a few years ago with some younger friends of mine. Uh, and this was data theoretical chemistry, but it's really chemistry and materials. But what's nice about this article is Matthias Rupp, uh, what he did, he's a, he's a computer scientist by training, and we did a, this glossary of terms which explained both the machine learning terms to the scientists and also some of this DFT alphabet soup to the machine learning people. And well, one thing we, you know, we tried to look at publications using this stuff. And again, you see this exponential rise, this very rapid exponential rise. And it turns out as well that when we looked at this thing, uh, the average paper used, that had machine learning in materials or chemistry had been cited 12 times, which isn't too bad because there weren't that many of them uh, a little while ago. But I just I looked yesterday or something at, the, at this curve from uh, Web of Science, and of course it's gone like this, and the average citation per paper is now 17, which gives you some sense of just how hot this topic is in, in physical sciences. Uh, and some of them, of course, are, are off the scale. Okay, so it's been taking off. So in this special topic, we had many, many different uh, uh, areas that we were covering. Uh, so there are many, many aspects of, of material science and chemistry that are, are covered in this. Uh, and, and people have been doing it for about 10 or 12 years or so in this area. Uh, so I'm going to give you a survey of some of the things that are going on. Uh, so this is called Nomad. This is some European friends of mine uh, in Berlin. They set this thing up about three or four years ago. Uh, and what it is is a uh, sort of central database of material science calculations, uh, mostly DFT calculations, but where people from all over the world are contributing to this database. And what it does is it takes calculations in virtually any code at all, and it uploads them into a standard format, and then you can probe it and see so far it contains 50 million calculations. Now, I have other friends who have 130 million calculations, 
Uh, so the idea is that instead of everybody redoing the calculations all the time, you can go look at this and see if the calculation you want to do is already done. And the other main thing is, of course, people are, this is all came about as part of the materials genome initiative. Uh, and the idea is that you can scan and do data science on these, on the, on the calculated materials and see if you can sort of find patterns uh, with trends for desired properties, right? So especially these days with 2D materials, uh, there's a lot of interest in, in sort of layered materials. Uh, uh, people, it is much, much easier, of course, to generate all the structures and the possible materials on the computer than it is to, to make them. People are now even able, to, a friend of mine is calculating whether or not it is possible to foliate uh, a layered material, as in be able to pull off uh, sort of single or double layers of the material. Uh, the US version of this is called a materials project. It was set up by, uh, mostly by Gert Cedar, at, uh, who's now at Berkeley. But the, it's, it was originally the materials genome, uh, but then the federal government took over that name, uh, and so they call it the materials project. The difference between the US version and the European version is that these guys generate the, the, all the uh, data in, the, in, the, in their database themselves. Uh, so, and again, you can look at the statistics and you see sort of how many different calculations are in there. And you can see that this is of the order of a million or so, as opposed to the 50 million, because people are uploading uh, they're publicly uploading to the NOMAD database. And again, I think at a talk I saw not so long ago, they said about 100 scientific papers so far had been written using this database. So one thing is people can use the database without doing any electronic structure calculations themselves. And of course, they're developing all these software tools for querying these databases and find, you know, going to find a material that has properties that you want. Uh, so this kind of stuff is especially important for battery research and for things like uh, photo cells. Force fields. So, it, so as I mentioned in molecular dynamics, when people do classical simulations, they can do easily a million, ten million atoms, uh, but they're not doing the, they're not solving the quantum problem for each configuration of the atoms. So a, a big thing that people have been uh, focused on, and I haven't been involved in this, uh, is uh, doing the, uh, coming up with new force fields. So you take an electronic structure method, you run the calculation, you get data, and you train a force field. Uh, now, if you look at, at sort of what exists in the literature, you know, water is this very ubiquitous substance of tremendous importance here, and there's at least 104 respectable force fields for water, right? So there are all these different uh, uh, force fields that people use for different purposes to simulate water and things dissolved in water. Uh, for in silicon, there's the Sillinger-Weber potential. So people made these potentials up intuitively, uh, they've turned out they've been very useful, but they don't achieve usually quantum chemical type accuracy. Uh, uh, so what has changed now is people are using these machine learning methods to learn. So what you do is you give it a bunch of data from a simulation, usually a DFT simulation. So, so you take snapshots and you choose which snapshots exactly uh, uh, very carefully, and then you uh, use machine learning to create a force field that's much more sophisticated than the ones that uh, were made up in the past, and then you sort of try it out and see how well it works in, in many different places. And there's two big applications of this. One is in, more in drug discovery, searching chemical compound space. So in drug discovery, do we have a, where's my periodic table, Roger? Uh, uh, so, hmm? <laughs> Uh, so usually we look at about 10 or 11 uh, main group elements and maybe one or two uh, interesting metals and you look at all possible combinations but it turns out even when you get to uh, something like 
12 atoms or so, it turns out there are 10 to the 60 different combinations that you can make, different sort of molecules you can make. So what people are doing are trying to search chemical compound space again for things with very good uses. Uh, and in order to do that, they want to create a force field, but these are very sort of chemically specific force fields where they really account for making and breaking bonds. Uh, the other big use is more in material science where you want to do a simulation, let's say of tungsten, with uh, several million atoms. And there's no way you can possibly do a cone sham calculation for something like that. Uh, but what, what they do is they run configurations and they, they choose them very carefully. So they put the tungsten in many, many different environments, tungsten atoms, and then uh, they can run these much bigger simulations once they've found a force field. And the people who really invented this field were Jörg Baylor, I think he was a graduate student at the time, and Michele Paranello, Paranello of this car Paranello molecular dynamics scheme. And you see this is from 2007, so this is already 13 years ago. And in this case, they're doing silicon uh, at 3,000 Kelvin, and they're looking at, the, at liquid silicon and looking at the, these different curves, and they're comparing to well-known force fields, and this NN is a neural net that they use to uh, calc, uh, construct this uh, much more accurate force field, which uh, can now be used for these uh, silicon simulations, much, much bigger than DF, regular DFT calculations. Uh, and there's a very nice uh, review by Jörg Baylor uh, from a few years ago uh, that explains how all that is done. Uh, these are papers from uh, our friend Gabor Sanyi. Uh, this was a good year for him. These are four physical review letters. Uh, and what they're doing is they're using uh, a Gaussian approximate potentials. Uh, so they're using a sort of Gaussian process to generate these potentials, and again, they do a lot of training. And so these are, they take six months or so to do all the training to get one of these force fields, but then once they have the force field, they can do all sorts of calculations that basically no one could do before, because you can uh, do them uh, for much larger numbers of atoms. So obviously they did boron, they've done uh, carbon, and, and various other things. So these are not so much for putting the atoms in different chemical environments. These are for putting a very, having a very large number of atoms and seeing what their thermodynamic properties are. Yes, James. Training on these smaller calculations. Yes, yes. And then based on that, they're assuming that whatever you learn from the atom simulation work for many atoms. Yes. Are we confident that you can do that? Uh, no, we're not confident. Uh, so the way you sort of find out basically is you, of course, test on situations that were not in your training set, right? Uh, but then even to do the test, you have to be able to do the calculation more accurately for the test. Uh, so then the test is also limited in size. And then so, so basically, they run the simulations, they get accurate results, and then in some cases, they can compare directly with experiment. And then they see that their methods are much better than existing handmade uh, potentials. Uh, one, one drawback I have to mention here is, so an advantage of what I call your grandpa's force field model, so like a Leonard Jones or Cylinder Weber, is it takes that to evaluate. It takes about 100 times longer to evaluate one of these because it is a much more complicated force field, right? Uh, but still, even at paying 100 times the cost, it's way faster than a quantum simulation. Yeah? In the grandfather thing, how does this uh, overcome the gradient assumption? So, so actually, this, this, so this, okay, so this methodology does not overcome that. What they're doing is they're taking standard DFT calculations, training a force field between the atoms on those calculations, and then running that force field. So their accuracy is only as good as the underlying DFT calculation that they use to train it. Is that what, that's what you're asking? Yes. Uh, but we'll get to that in just a second, because we'll see in the last couple of years, they've gone past that. Uh, 
So yes, yeah, so this is, a, uh, I will say, a good friend of mine, Klaus Robert Mueller, and at the, I noticed at the talk we had two, two weeks ago from Michael Pritchard from Earth System Science, he was using this, this way, these heat maps of understanding how the machine learning figures out, you know, try to understand the pattern behind how it did it. Uh, this was created by his gang. So he's a very distinguished uh, machine learning person. Uh, he started in support vector machines at TU Berlin. And he says he has these sort of various hobbies. One of them is material science. Another one is neuroscience. And they do all sorts of fantastic things. Uh, they're in computer science. But they've developed this, uh, this, this force field for uh, sort of molecular discovery. And now instead of training it on DFT calculations, they actually pay the price of solving, doing ab initio quantum chemistry. So they go beyond DFT accuracy and they make a force field that is more accurate than, than DFT calculations. And they can go up to a few dozen atoms. Uh, and so, and then look at all sorts of uh, new molecules uh, for drug discovery. And there's also this uh, a competitor of that is this ANI-1. Uh, and uh, this is actually, its full name is Anakin, uh, because Oscar Isayev is a big fan of the Star Wars uh, 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 sequence. And anyway, so these, are the, the, I think they have 130 million uh, a database of 130 million in order to train. And they have eight heavy atoms and hydrogen and carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Uh, again, all the things that are relevant to sort of medicinal chemistry. So, and, and these kind of applications, right? So the ones that are sort of toward the bio end, there are all the issues of intellectual property and who's paying for what. And actually we had a talk about a month ago, uh, for an old friend, a uh, former student of Shal Mukamel's, uh, who's now at Los Alamos, Sergei Trediak. And this, this graduate student here was hired at Los Alamos, and now they're using the Los Alamos machines, which are fast, in order to do sort of much deeper learning, but using, starting from uh, uh, this, this methodology. Uh, and so they can do, uh, much bigger simulations and include many more atoms. Uh, and that's called, uh, I can't remember what that's called. Okay. Okay, so that's, that's the broad view of this, of this field. And then we'll get into my sort of technical detail. So everybody could leave now if they want to, because it's going to get a little technical. Or but do we have questions on, on this part? At the back. So what can you do if you don't have big muscle? If you don't have what? Big muscle, big computer resources. Uh, I'm about to show you. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I do have access to some big computing resources, but I rarely uh, like to use them. Uh, so, so, so we're going to do kernel range regression. Uh, so now, these days, you know, almost everything you see is neural nets, right? But Kernel rate regression was around long before then, and maybe it'll be around long after them. Uh, and, and, and this is what Klaus taught me. Uh, so so the, the work that we've done is either this exchange, so this exchange correlation energy, this little piece of the energy as a functional of the density, right? If we could get it more accurately, right, or more reliably, or for situations where our current approximations fail, uh, this is worth so much to so many people, right? It would just change the kind of science we can simulate. Uh, uh, so, so everybody wants to get this, but in order to get data to train for this, you have to solve the quantum problem. And actually you have to sort of solve it in reverse, which is even more expensive in order to pull this guy out. Uh, so that's a bit hard. Uh, but either looking at the kinetic energy, which allows you to bypass the cone sham equations or this guy. Uh, so this is a much easier problem to look at because all the DFT calculations in the world produce data for, for, for this guy here. 
And what people are doing nowadays, either they take the existing approximations and try to make them more accurate, the human designed ones for this guy, or the most of what we've done is trying to create density functionals that look nothing like the ones that people create by just directly training the functional, which we know sort of must exist on the data, and we'll see uh, how we get on with that. So one of the things is kernel ridge regression. Uh, so, so this is, I call this small data, right? And it's in a sense just, here, here's it showing just curve fitting where we have a bunch of noisy data about a, uh, a curve. And so, so you, you create a kernel which measures the distance within, uh, within your space. And you look at the error in some uh, function uh, in your space versus the data that you have. And this lambda, you have a couple of global parameters, the sigma and this lambda. The lambda determines how noisy the curve is and you want to choose these parameters so as to neither overfit or underfit. You want to get a, a, a good representation of the curve, but you don't want it to be jumping up and down trying to pass through all the points. So with, with this kernel trick, you can sort of write it down as a linear algebra problem and solve. Uh, for it, on the other hand, once you go about beyond about 5,000 data points, it starts becoming very, very expensive to evaluate. So, so the trick with kernel ridge regression is uh, sort of setting up the space, the re representation of your problem, so that you can, uh, with a sort of very generic kernel, here's a Gaussian, you can rather quickly get highly accurate uh, results. Uh, so what we did was we took a, a very simple problem of just particles in various boxes with different potentials in them and said, could we figure out their kinetic energy as a functional of the density? Nobody had ever been able to do that accurately enough. And we used a Gaussian kernel, but it's a kernel in the density space. So it's fully non-local. So it's very different from the human design functionals. And within a few weeks, uh, a graduate student here of mine here in physics, John Snyder, and Matthias Rupp, he was a postdoc at the time, uh, were very quickly able to get very high accuracy in the energies, but then it took us a while to figure out how to get the derivatives. And in the intervening time, people have focused an awful lot on sort of what we call auto differentiation of the methods uh, so that you make sure that things like derivatives come out right at that time. We sort of had to do it by hand, uh, but we managed to do it as a proof of principle. Since that time, you know, that's a proof of principle. You want to get to more accurate, uh, more realistic things. Uh, along the way, a very good undergraduate, again, a physicist, uh, we wrote this paper where we took a simple function and applied all these high-level machine learning tricks, uh, well, the kernel ridge regression tricks to this function to fitting the simple function, but it gave us a lot of insight into what the machine learning was doing. So this is, uh, so here we're looking at the errors as a function of these hyperparameters and looking inside the space to see uh, exactly, and, and some of the things are very disturbing that you find if you're a physical scientist. Uh, there's certainly sort of your lots of overfitting going on. And these days people are doing that a lot with the neural networks and often finding these very shallow, min, uh, very wide minima uh, that the, the, the neural networks are finding as they're fit to various problems. Uh, anyway, so this paper was fun because this was sort of a follow-up to uh, this one and another one were follow-ups to the physical review letter. And often in the past, you would write a physical review letter, which is an important thing, and then you write the long version to explain lots of details. So we write the long version and we send it to physical review B, I think, and they say, well, that's, so half the referees say, that's what's well, really nice, you know, but there's no physics in this. Where's the physics gone, right? And then the other half would say, I hate this machine learning stuff and this should never be published. So most, almost all my papers always go through. This was a very novel experience given to me by machine learning. We got, I think, 10 rejections before we could publish this thing. Uh, we sent, I sent it to a buddy who's an editor at a, a chemistry journal. Comes back, where's the molecule? 
right? There was no molecule. So he said, yeah, it's a nice paper, but I'm sorry, right? We're a journal of uh, chemical stuff. Uh, so eventually we put it in this International Journal of Quantum Chemistry. You know, I forgot to check. It's been cited 30 or 40 times uh, in, in the five years since we did it. Okay. Uh, this is one of the more recent ones, this malonaldehyde movie. Uh, so, and so this is a, the a hydrogen atom being transferred uh, so, uh, from one oxygen to another. So, but all of this, this MD simulation was done by uh, learning the, the density functional to avoid solving the cone sham equations. And in our training set, we didn't have this hydrogen transfer reaction happen, but then it happens uh, in, in when we run the molecular dynamics using the machine learned force field. So this proved uh, that you can really do that. And an odd coincidence, uh, if this thing hasn't frozen, this was a paper that I wrote with uh, Jacob Hollingsworth. Who, Jacob, are you here? Yeah. Uh, who, who came and checked out our group uh, when he first came to UCI, but then decided we weren't good enough for him and went to work uh, with Daniel. But he did a very nice piece of work where he tested these exact conditions that people use in density functional theory uh, on the machine, uh, on the machine learned functionals. And in some cases, they really helped make things more accurate. In other cases, not so much. Uh, okay. Uh, so one last thing, one last little example I want to show you is I had this really great student, Lee Lee, uh, who worked on all this stuff. And he, he and I worked with Steve White uh, to look at strongly correlated problems. Uh, and we do this in, in sort of one dimension. But I was at a, uh, he, so he, he, the problem I set him to do actually turned out to be really hard. I didn't mean to set him quite such a hard problem, but he managed to solve it by the time he, he, was, he was finished. And he did it by finding the right representation for the kernel ridge regression to, uh, to make it work. You always have to find a good representation. And the representation he used was a principal component analysis based on a, a, an idea that's very common in chemistry, an atoms and molecules idea, uh, but is not much used at all in physics. But he'd heard about it. In fact, I have a much better version of atoms and molecules which happily he decided not to use because it takes far too long to compute. Uh, and he used the sort of generic version and that was good. But so when I was trying to explain this at a meeting that I was at a quantum chemistry meeting, I had to explain about the principal component analysis. So in order to illustrate it, uh, I said, you know, uh, so it's used in facial uh, recognition or at least, well, it's not anymore, but uh, so it's a very simple trick in, in, in machine learning. So, so what he had me do on my Mac, so this was the night before the talk in the hotel room, and I have to take 16 different pictures of my face, right, with different expressions on my face each time. Okay, so then uh, what he does is, now he does everything in black and white because he's trying to do it overnight uh, before I give the talk the next day. So this is apparently my mean face, right? So this is the average of those 16 pictures, right? Uh, and then principal component analysis, you look along the directions in which you have uh, the most variation in the data. So you figure out these principal components and then you decompose your data. So in one of these pictures, there's a vast amount of data, but then this is the average of it all. And then you add one principal component and then two and three and four and five and six uh, and seven and eight. And, and the picture, the particular picture we're trying to get was that. So, so actually, this is my mean face. Uh, and you can see that you can't quite figure out somebody's emotional state with just uh, seven extra components, right? But think of the data compression, right? There's now seven coefficients uh, that uh, rep, you know, are used to reproduce one of the particular pictures. Uh, so it's very, very effective. And what he did was he took uh, these chains of hydrogen atoms and he used this atomic decomposition and he looked at all the different atoms within all sorts of different chains and he, he could end up 
with these seven principal components were enough to represent the density of a whole chain. And then suddenly his calculations went, you know, about a million times faster because he's just representing things very simply. And he ends up getting uh, quantum chemical accuracy on this infinite chain of hydrogens, uh, periodic chain, and comparing to Steve White's DMRG, uh, it agrees beautifully with it. And once again, so this calculation was all done in this little 1D world that Steve and I had set up a few years previously. And then in the paper, we explain at the end, well, this is one dimension, and this is what you have to do to go beyond one dimension. So all three referees said, yeah, this is nice, but it's only in one dimension. So, you know, it's not that important, and reject. So we went off to FISREB B, and again, that's now been cited, I don't know how many times. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, most recently, Bupa Lee, uh, who is our uh, data science fellow, has been using, we're trying to build in some really hardcore uh, sort of physics knowledge, math knowledge into designing these functionals so that their derivatives and things come out well. And she tries things out on things like the Hubbard dimer, so really, really simple systems. Uh, and coming soon, uh, we have a whole bunch of stuff uh, coming out. Okay, so. Uh, so this was, yeah, these are uh, Bupali slides about the nexus, right? And this is what we're trying, you know, people across the different departments are trying to do. Uh, okay. So how am I doing time-wise? Give me three, what can I have? Two, two more minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So, so, so during this little odyssey, uh, learning about this machine learning stuff, right, I have some observations, right? Uh, so one thing is almost everything I deal with is, is computer generated data, right? So we're playing always these games of going from one level of theory to another to another, always trying to cheapen the cost of the calculation in order to be able to do bigger things. So one thing is our data is essentially noise free. And that's very different from any experimental data, usually, right? Uh, one basic question in these kind of things is, can you reduce your problem to image processing or not? If it can be reduced to image processing, especially if it's a standard size image, uh, then there are lots of tools off the shelf that can be very, very effective, because this is what sort of a lot of machine learning stuff uh, grew up out of, and especially this is why you get in a lot of successes in sort of biological things because you, you know a lot of stuff is images and what can you extract from the images. Uh, now reproducibility is a question. So it has come to my attention, Pierre, that in computer science, right, people, I mean the field moves so fast that people, what people want to do is find an algorithm and test whether or not the algorithm works. But in, in, at the other extreme is things like quantum chemistry, where you sort of list all the information to about 10 digits. And when you're refereeing a paper, you can rerun the calculation and get all the same exact numbers to 10 digits with your code. This is a bit of an issue uh, with some of the stuff that goes on. Hamiltonians, right? All, all the things that we care about a, a lot in, say, physics and chemistry, they come from Hamiltonians. This greatly restricts sort of what can happen. We, we know whenever we do any kind of simulation, if it starts doing something unphysical, you almost immediately recognize it if you're a well-trained scientist. Uh, but that information, that knowledge is extremely difficult to teach to a computer algorithm. Now, what are the restrictions on what can happen? Uh, statistics, right, a lot of these methods are statistical. This is great when you have this sort of big, huge amount of data. It's not so, uh, it converges very slowly uh, when you have a small amount of data. There are so many possibilities when you set up something to look at it with machine learning methods, right? There are so many variations in the way that you can do it uh, that, uh, it can be very difficult to figure out what is the, the best way, is there the only way. People were asking me at KITP up in Santa Barbara uh, whether or not this represented a paradigm shift, and I think it does. They were sort of baiting me, saying uh, whether or not this was, I think it does. And one thing to keep in mind, 
Planck figures out his constant in 1900, but Schrodinger only gets the equation in 1926. So you can have an entire career in science between this time and this time and not have a clue what is going on because you don't know what the underlying equation is. Paradigm shifts take a while, right? Basically the time scale is for the senior people in the field to die, right? Uh, 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 and I, th I, I think there is, and what it is, is we've come to this point where we have sufficient computer resources to essentially implement fairly rudimentary Bayesian ideas and, and be able to calculate enough uh, to be able to sort of work through all these possibilities, and that's what these neural nets are doing. And, and there's been a sea change, and this is why Things worked a little bit in the 90s, but there wasn't enough to make it widespread uh, as it is today. And the last thing I want to mention is bad. I can't resist this, right? I said something about the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? Uh, so you see a lot of stuff, right, uh, coming out at the moment. So I get a lot of papers to referee from many different fields, right? I would say at least half of them, maybe 70%, uh, are like sufficiently sort of bad on the face of them, right, that they shouldn't be published. The authors have not done basic work in order to meet what I would normally call minimal standards. Uh, there's a huge amount of uh, missing the existing literature. Uh, lots of claims of significance because it's the first use of AI, right? Uh, all sorts of things are the first use of AI. Uh, there's lots of cherry picking of data sets, metrics, and all sorts of things uh, where you can choose how you measure things in order to make sure you get the desired result. Uh, and generally sort of sloppy science is going on. Now just because this is happening, right, doesn't mean there isn't lots of really good stuff going on. So obviously all the stuff I showed you is the good stuff, right? Uh, uh, no, there's lots of like the, the force fields and things like this. this is all very good stuff, but these are people who've been in the field for at least a decade. Uh, and I found one recently, uh, and this came out, you know, in Nature Nanotechnology uh, a few months ago, and then there's a, a comment on it pointing out that the great new molecule that was found using the machine learning method was almost identical to one that had been found 10 years previously. And not only that, the one that had been found 10 years previously was in the training set uh, of the machine learning, right? Uh, and this is not, you know, uh, this is the kind of stuff that happens. Okay. Uh, so the, who can tell me? This was my subtitle. What is this, what is this quote from? Sorry? <laughs> you ruined my joke, right? Because you're supposed to say Aldous Huxley, right? Uh, but in fact, it's uh, yeah, exactly, right? Uh, it's this sort of noble savage who can only express himself in Shakespearean language, who's been left out of the brave new world, the very shiny brave new world, and so this is what he calls it. Uh, and of course, everyone is happy and content in the brave new world because they take the soma pills, which keeps them happy and content, uh, and nothing drastic is ever allowed to happen. Uh, and the savage is appalled by uh, the world that has been created. So this is just a, you know, uh, just a word of warning, right, with the machine learning. And thanks to my students, and thanks for your attention. Speaking of questions just now, I want to speak paradigm shift again, if I might. Again, noting today is Amer uh, International Women in Science Day, a lighthearted remark at the start. I want you to take a serious indulgence in this moment. And look around the room and consider the gender representation that you see. My mother is an organic chemist in her 90s, and at your age, if she were to sit in such a crowd, it would likely be that she was the only woman in the room. I was very, very happy to tell her a couple months ago that your efforts brought the incoming graduate class to physical sciences this year 51% female. Thank you, everybody, for the efforts in that paradigm shift. Now, 
questions for Professor Mark to help guide discussions in machine learning. I have a comment, and I, I'm sorry to sort of focus on the negative, but you, you talked about sort of the, the bad. Yes. And I have to say, I have seen a little bit of that too in my own subfield that there is a dangerous tendency to be very excited about your hammer and just find very boring nails. Yes. And that's what it is a lot of. It's a lot of just kind of boring nails and look at my fancy hammer. And I really think it should be the other way around. I, we're good at identifying the most interesting problems. Let's figure out how we can use these amazing tools to solve those incredibly important problems rather than the other way around. I guess at least that, that's my take on it. Yes. I, I would say a little bit like, in some sense, having the hammer and the nails, this is a good thing to go around trying stuff out. Yes. Right? Yes. It's just that some stuff gets a little bit sort of oversold. And yeah, so one of the comments that these people made. Uh, this thing was, they pointed out, they questioned, they said there was a lot of hype about the paper that, they, that had done this, and they pointed out that if a person had found this new molecule and figured out its selectivity properties relative to the existing ones, not only would it not have made uh, a big splash, it probably wouldn't have even been publishable. Right? It was such a minor uh, change in the organic chemistry that it wasn't actually worth the scientific publication. But because it had been found <laughs> yeah. this way, uh, there were, I looked at the paper a little more carefully and there were lots of issues. Uh, but so, so it is good. I mean, part of it is discovery, right? So you're just trying things out. And that's sort of fine, but then yeah, when you sort of do this inverted thing where you take the very fancy thing and apply it, get something only marginally better, not so. I mean, I, but at the same time, I sort of hesitate to even say that because I think big picture, I tend to agree with you that this is yes, this is the future. And if you're not if you're not aware of these tools, it's like not knowing calculus or something like it's. Like we really do need to sort of embrace these tools to right to make progress. And I gave a. So a colloquium I think, to the math graduate students in Santa Barbara, and and the way they came to me, they said, "We want you to talk to them about machine learning." We don't know what to talk to our students about about this thing because, like, almost all these very applied and pure math students had started doing some machine learning on the side, and that was their primary interest, right? And it was like. You know, the professors want them to work on these hard math problems. And I was trying to explain, you know, sort of, and then, and then many of them were disappearing before they got their PhDs. Yeah. Because once they got their machine learning going, they were hired very, very quickly. So, yeah, so it is this kind of, but this is what happens when there is a new thing, and people try it in all sorts of things, and there's all sorts of stuff goes on, right? But what I think will happen over the next 10 years, roughly, is we will figure out much better the rules for how this stuff works. And I think we will make, um, physicists especially are beginning to make progress on sort of figuring out how to build in this, you know, posterior, uh, yeah, the physics. knowledge of the yeah. physics. I, I have a question, I just want, sorry, I don't, I'm sorry to monopolize these questions, but I have one more question for you if you don't mind. You've talked about the Hamiltonian. Yes. And I'm not sure if you have seen sort of Daniel Whiteson talk about what he is trying to do, but there's this kind of really interesting philosophical thing where, like if you're doing chemistry, you know the Hamiltonian and you can't break the laws of physics. But if you're trying to use these kind of techniques to discover new laws of physics, yes. at some level you want to be a little bit lenient on what you mean by break the laws of physics. So it's kind of interesting sure. to think about like, you know, what we're doing here as scientists and what are we allowed to constrain and not allowed to constrain in these sort of Yes. discoveries. And, and there is a sort of new field that's slowly evolving of what they call <laughs> symbolic regression, which tries to get at that sort of question, which is instead of searching on data, you search on sort of simple functions. Mm -hmm. but when you start thinking about what does that even mean, it becomes horribly ill-defined. But the idea is how does a physicist extract simple laws yes. from you know 
complex observational data with noise in it? Right. And, and, and is there a simple underlying thing, which is not something that these methods can ever tell. Right. These are fully sort of numerical, right? Yeah. And, 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 and of course, and part of it is then you look at the law and you see something that you can understand, that a physicist, under, a human understands, rather than trying to reverse engineer it out of these black boxes. So if you do principal components analysis, it gives you simple answers, and you don't know what they mean. That's right. And it gives you the mean face. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Would you share what your heuristics are when, when you're constructing your pipeline to generate synthetic data for machine learning model and molecular dynamics? What, what are your heuristics for you know, knowing that your generated <laughs> data is, is plausible. Right, so it, uh, it's very sort of intuitive, right? So, so for the little movie I showed you, right? It was interesting, so that's uh, all driven by experience and knowing what is visible. So, to do the little molecule, uh, I don't think I have it with me, what we did was we did a, first a classical force field calculation of molecular dynamics at 300 degrees Kelvin at room temperature, and the molecule does its sort of various vibrations. And then we take 2,000 snapshots of that. On each snapshot, we do a DFT calculation, and then for, from those calculations, we train our machine learning model, and then we run MD on the machine learned model. When we first, when we did exactly what I just said, it didn't really work. And the reason it didn't work was because the, we, we, we had to then run it later at 500 Kelvin. And the reason is when the temperature is higher, the molecule will explore more of its potential energy surface uh, than it does at 300 Kelvin. And in the time in which we were doing this stuff and writing it up and all that, people learned that you know, a lot of these things, it's the outline data mm -hmm. that is informing the machine learning, not the big chunk of it, that is around equilibrium where nothing much is happening. Uh, and so, but, but in order to generate, right, we see we did this very physical thing, right? Now, since the time of that paper and the other papers with force fields, people are beginning to notice a pretty horrible feature they call holes, where, so you're running uh, some big complicated MD simulation with one of these force fields. What happens is the force, you accidentally hit some configuration that is sort of orthogonal to all your training data, and it'll, it'll produce a nonsense force at that point. Well, with a nonsense force, it'll push the atoms in that direction, and suddenly you go down to somewhere totally unphysical. So it's like a hole in the potential energy surface. And yet, if you solve these cone charm equations with an approximate functional, that never happens because you built in the physics of the thing into the underlying way that the calculation is done. So does that answer? So that's exactly the way we sort of do these things, right? And it's using the stuff we already kind of know, but to formalize that, I have no idea how to do that. I mean, usually if you can, what the, it depends what <coughs> system you are looking at. So what, when you say you did a couple cluster calculation, of what is that? More like about like uh, reaction like Yes, yes. Like, so the reason you would do the couple clusters is because you need a, a pretty high accuracy in something like a reaction barrier, and you have to be confident that it, you are that accurate because the rate constant is very sensitive to the barrier, right? Right. So, 
So most DFT calculations, most DFT methods won't be as reliable and as accurate as that for that barrier. I mean, some will, uh, will sort of be pretty good in that situation, but you can't be certain that it's good enough. So very often you have to do a couple of cluster, which means it's rather slow on the computer, right? Yeah. As you may have noticed, yeah. Uh, yeah, and we have various methods for trying to make TFT work as well as that. But generically, it doesn't quite work as well, but it goes much faster, right? And so you can do a much bigger system. Yeah. So Friday at four, you can bring your machine learning questions and our smart graduate students will solve them for you while you have a beverage. See you here Friday at four for those with problems with that. Thank you very much, Kieran. I appreciate it. Thank you.